agree. I mean, I think that also women have trouble saying no, which I'm going to get to in a moment. But I just had a thought as I was listening. I think our, it would be great if our listeners would call in with yeah. with um, their stories about how they feel emotionally exhausted. I think that is a it's a great segue. Um, it's the equivalent of a medical question. You know, what do I do if I have breast cancer? Here's my situation. I feel emotionally exhausted. You know, or or I feel exhausted because this has happened to me. I, we would really love to hear our listeners' stories about about emotional exhaustion. Um, I think that's how we highlight the topic, because you're right, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. You don't have to define what emotional exhaustion is, but I think if people would call in and talk about their stories, um, that would be a wonderful way for us to continue the discussion. So if you do have any, any uh, uh, thoughts or stories or examples, give us a call at 877-698-3627. So, so with that, Nancy, I'm just going to ask you kind of when, when women come to you, is this something that they will, um, that you will tell them or they'll come and they'll say, and then when, when it's, when it's obvious, what what path do you take with them? What advice do you give them? What path? What suggestions? Yes. Sort of what happens yes. when you know it? Well, often women will describe various symptoms. They might describe a sense of resentment, for example, of resentment for having to continue to give. Or they might describe, for example, a lostness, um, a sense of disconnection or alienation from themselves. And what I start to do is I start to invite them back into the conversation of their own life. So what that means is, first of all, to become aware of how am I giving myself away? How am I abandoning myself? How am I morphing into what is wanted and needed and giving and giving and turning my back on myself. First, we have to become aware of this habitual behavior. Secondly, as I said, invite your still small voice. What do I want? What if I were to live my life by what I want? That's heresy, right? What if I were to start to actually pay attention to my own longings? And what do I face when thinking about that? Then gets the really juicy stuff. I start to invite women to start telling the truth in little baby ways. Start risking being disappointing. I, I say for us uber competent women, um, the willingness to be disappointing is a superpower <laughs> because <laughs> we will do anything but to be disappointing, right? So, and what's always amazing to me is how much energy we pour into making people we don't, we won't ever see again or don't even like ourselves like us, right? Like the barista in the coffee shop or the flight attendant. We're constantly trying to not be disappointing. So I have women practicing in their relationship, try saying what's actually true, what you think and feel, to stand in your own shoes, feel yourself present and real, that's where we replenish ourselves. Not so much in the um, getting a better moisturizer, but actually coming into your own truth. So it's an emotional process, but it starts with awareness. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, and I'm thrilled to say we're getting a bunch of phone calls here. So let's go to Janet in New Jersey. Good morning, Janet. How can we help you? Good morning. Um, good morning. I just want to comment. You really hit a nerve uh, with this topic for me. Um, I was just um, actually having this conversation with my husband. Um, he was saying something about findings on the eye. I said, well, you know what? You know, like, don't you realize I need help? Um, Beautiful. And he's like, then why don't you ask? <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> why don't men actually notice these things? I'm retired. Um, I have for a number of years, but I'm involved in a couple of um, volunteer organizations. And um, so I keep busy mentally. Otherwise, you can go to mush. And um, I have an elderly mother-in-law that I'm pretty much the go-to person for 
Um, and I, my daughter, who's actually in her 30s, has been quite sick, so I've been running that end. And it just feels like you get pulled, that sandwich generation, you get pulled from all ends. And um, it, it's just, it's you, for me, I feel like I have to do it. I want to do it. And then it turns out I also have my senior gravis and hereditary angioedema, which are flaring. And of course they're flaring because I'm not resting enough. I'm not, you know, doing what I need to do for myself. But um, it's like, how do you make that step? So, um, Janet, I think you hit. Say, I'm just yeah. going to stop it all. Yeah, <sighs> I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that you like to do you feel like you have to do it but you also like to do it and you need a rest i think that's the dilemma for most women you know women are taught to to do everything we do everything we do we are the caregivers and now that women are working more we're caregivers and we work and we have to go to the store and get the food and we you know and we're cooking and caring for extended families i see here you take care of your mother-in-law and your daughter um and your husband and yourself and and i think when you say you like to do it i mean i i've i've been in this situation so many times i i love doing what i do but i think you also hit on something where you said don't men know I think it, it, it would even be nice if your husband just once said, let me help. He doesn't have to help every day. He doesn't have to help all the time. But sometimes what I'm hearing through what you're saying is that you're the only one. Everybody expects you to do it. You just do it. And no one, even once in a while, says, let me help you. And I think that would go a long way. And sometimes you need to tell the other people in your life. You know, I'm happy to do this. I love doing this. But let's say every Thursday you're going to be the one to do X. You know, maybe just a little bit of help goes a long way. Would you agree with that? I want to jump in here, too, if I can add one quick thing. The word but is the problem, I think, because we say we love all of this, but I need caretaking, too. We need to shift that but to an and. And. So they're not contradictions. We have been raised to believe that these are contradictions. Your caretaking of you sits right alongside caretaking of all these other people. And what I would say to you, in addition to asking, which is absolutely necessary, is to give yourself permission to take care of you. Regardless of in the beginning, they may say, why is she doing that? Why is she? It doesn't matter. The the first step is saying, I care about me. And that means I need to slow down. I need to do the things that make me well. Often, the biggest impediment is our own waiting for the others to see that we're struggling. Or wait, we have to step in there and say, you know what? I matter to me. And I love that. I love the replacing the word but with and. I think that's a great suggestion, Nancy. Yes. And the other thing I would say, Janet, is um, it, it's also to do it to sh- when you take care of yourself, you model that for your daughter. You know, I think that part of what we're saying here is this is what we've learned and we've learned because that's what we watched our mothers do and our grandmothers do so if your daughter sees that you ask for help and you get help she'll that will be the model that she learns from so i think these these calls are wonderful um please we're talking about emotional exhaustion give us a call with your stories we've got a whole bank full of calls here at 877-698-3627 i'm speaking with nancy collier who wrote the book the emotionally exhausted woman and we have a really wonderful discussion here it's an important topic about women taking care of themselves i guess it with women's health that's the most important thing we do so it's let's everything. go to right let's go to terry in sacramento terry good morning thanks for holding and how can we help you this morning good morning um when i was 10 years old grandmother had a stroke and she didn't want to go to a facility so we took care of her at home and when i was 
you know, get home from school, I had to help change the bed and clean the, you know, um, mess and all that stuff. And so I did that for three years. And then, um, but my mom worked, so they didn't have to do it. It was, it was left up to me and the nurse that they had there. And then when my mom had dementia, you know, she expected me to help her, not my brothers, because I was the girl. And for, I think for us, it was generational that the women just always did it. But I became really resentful because she didn't take me. Right. You know, but she did me to take care of her. So, um, so often the case. It's so often the case. Yeah, so I'm trying not to do that. I'm not trying to make my daughter any different than my son, you know, when I, um, when they're in their 30s now, but and my daughter says, I don't want to have children, you know, I don't want to go through that, but, but you know, like that, and uh, so I'm fine with that, but I'm so you know, appreciative of you having this show today. Good. I, I'm, I, I think it's you. important. Yeah, and if I can offer you something, which is that we bring that compassion for that little you, you know, who didn't get taken care of like a daughter in a certain sense, right? Got right into the parenting role. That you double down now on giving her that caretaking, right? That your hand goes on your own heart. And wow, you really didn't get this. You were assigned this role of you know parents so young and now sweetheart you know offer offer yourself the extra dose of you get to be taken care of with such kindness that comes from such a place of deep love for this being that is you and remember, you can't take care of anyone else if you haven't taken care of yourself, you know. I mean, I when I first started the show, the first week I was on, I remember something that I said, and it was that woman's health is everybody's health, which it really is, because if we're not healthy, both in mind and in body, we can't take care of anybody else. Yeah. So I, You know what kills me about that line? I always giggle a little bit with that line because I feel like we found a way to take care of ourselves in order to take care of others. I mean, it's just a little bit of a pet peeve I've had. Put, put your own oxygen mask on so that mm-hmm. you can help others. I would like us to put on our own oxygen masks and fill our own buckets so that we can be well. You know, Mm -hmm. we built in this sort of cultural narrative. Trust me, we really, our end goal is taking care of you, but we have to get a little breadcrumb first before we can do that, right? But I I hear you. I mean, obviously. You are right. Yes. All right, let's go to Robin in Boston. Good morning, Robin. Tell us your story. Good morning. Um, You don't have time to hear my whole story. Let me tell you what I've well, give us some. <laughs> I figured out. Um, I finally figured out. Well, I've kind of known it a long time, but implementing it is something totally different. I truly believe that we teach people how to treat us. And I think if people pause and they think about that, it's very, very true. So, yes, as a woman, a man, whatever, we teach people how to treat us. So, therefore, so if I've always accepted the directives, if I've always down the walk on the eggshells if I've always been codependent with somebody, well then why shouldn't they treat me that way? Because they're with them, right? So for me, the work has come in finding the strength within myself to put myself as the priority and be able to, like I think you said earlier, risk a little disappointment, risk being vulnerable, because when you change the rules of the game, boy, do people respond. And not always in a positive way. Sometimes yes. in a positive way. And I also learned that when we expect, like I was thinking about what this other woman said earlier about, oh, it would be nice if my husband, you know, offered them to all, blah, blah, blah. I also learned, and yes, it would be wonderful. And it would be wonderful if people could anticipate our needs and know our needs. But the flip side of that is if I really don't want to be disappointed about something, then I ask for what I need. You know, I'm not going to wait for my spouse to go, Oh, geez, I think you probably would like to go to the ballet and see the Nutcracker. No. I might be disappointed and say, you know what? I'd really like to go to the Nutcracker this season. How about if we get tickets? That's um, right. 
And that's it. Personally, personally, I've gotten a lot more satisfaction. I haven't gotten... That's, those are the ways I take care of myself. You know, I evaluate the relationships that are really important to me, and I try to say what I need. Because you can't expect somebody to always know. It would be wonderful, and we'd love that, and it's a great fantasy. But if somebody really loves you and wants to please you, they'll be happy to hear what you want. They'll That's right. That's to- right. People are not mind readers. You're 100% right, Rob. And people are not mind readers, and they may just need... The people often are not doing it out of malice. It's There's so many factors about why people behave the way they do, and it's often not malicious. You know, that not everyone, but uh, <laughs> so I do agree with you. You have to model your behavior. Um, you have to t- and you have to speak up for yourself. We Women much more than men. And I just want to go back to that saying no for a moment, because that's that's another component of this, I think, is that women. One of my kids or first grade teachers once said to me, you know, you're allowed to say no without an explanation, because something yeah. that women do often is they feel so guilty about saying no that they say, oh, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that because blah, 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 blah. Complete sentence. (laughs) Correct, correct. And men often just say no, and that's the end, and you move on. And women do not do that, and women need to learn how to say no without feeling guilty, without an explanation. You're allowed to say no when you're asked to do something. No is a complete sentence. That's one of the greatest lines of all. Yeah, Mm -hmm. That's right. It's wonderful. And, you know, one other thing, too... Speaking to your point is that I get so many women in my office who talk about being called a nag. You know, they ask for something to be done to their partner. It's not done. They ask, they ask, they ask. And on the fourth ask, they are called, oh, gosh, get off my back, and so on, so on, so on. What what I instruct a lot of women to do, and, and this is a bit paradoxical in our culture, is tune in to what's really important. If what you want is to get the curtains hung, right, get out of this battle with the husband I should have, the partner I should have, and take on, call a handyman. It's going to shift the dynamic like crazy, and your partner might not be so pleased with that, but we get out of this old codependent kind of way of relating, waiting for you to take care of what I really want and need, and let me take that on where I can, right? So it's a very different way of looking at your life, which is I can take care of what much of what I need and let me get on with that and get out of this battle of you should be seeing what I need, taking care of that, and so on. And what's interesting is we think, oh, without work and intimate relationship, in fact, it opens up a much deeper connection. Because we're out of that codependent kind of, why aren't you the person you should be, and blah, blah, blah. Call the handyman. So this is Women's Health. I'm Dr. Karen Behar. I'm here with Nancy Collier this morning talking about the emotionally exhausted woman. And we are loving getting your stories about feeling exhausted, feeling uh, overwhelmed. Please give us a call at 877-698-3627. Um, 